So this talk will be about basics of lithography and we split it in two parts. In the first part I will talk a little more about general things. I will have an introduction and I talk a little bit about chip making in general. Um, then I will go into how photolithography works, how the tools that we use today work and then I will uh, give some very simple insights in uh, photoresist which is an essential part in lithography and then in the second part of this presentation I will go more into uh, imaging and a uh, little more into the depth of uh, how these things work. So let's begin with the introduction. One thing that I need to point out, this is a slide about transistors. Why do we talk about transistors in a talk about basics of lithography? Because all the chips that we use, that we make with lithography, the, the fundamental piece that makes these chips work is the transistor. And when you look at, since the invention of transistor around in the 1950s, uh, this is a chart of some uh, sources that I've listed down here. Uh, the blue curve is the number of transistors produced per year and the red curve is the number of transistors made since then. So the red curve is the integral of the blue curve. Uh, just for those who ask themselves the question that I asked my, when I integrated the blue curve, why is it not much larger than the blue curve and of course the answer is this is a logarithmic scale and the integral of the exponential function is the exponential function. So this is properly calculated. The red curve gives you the number of transistors produced since their invention for any given year. Uh, the data that I have, they ended in 2014 in 2014, humankind has produced about 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 20 transistors. This is a relatively huge number. If you now ask the question, so if we built since 1955 to 2014, if we built all these transistors, how many transistors does this mean have been built in average every year? And that is a mind-blowing number. It's an average of 400 billion and there's since English and Europeans have different uh, prefixes for those numbers. So it's 4 times 10 to the 11 transistors built every second in average since, 2000, uh, since uh, 1955. Alone in 2014, we built 6 times 10 to the 12 transistors per second in 2014 worldwide. A huge number of pieces, probably nothing else has been built to this amount of numbers. I, I think it is fair to extrapolate, so I've had, I have no data here but it is probably fair to assume it kind of continues this way. Um, so about this time, we have been built about 10 to the 22 transistors. And now if we want to understand how this compares to other numbers. So in 1968 already, humankind has built as many transistors as our Milky Way has suns. In around 2000, we have built as many transistors as you would need rice corns to fill that famous chess, chessboard. And uh, the number estimated, the number of stars in the visible universe is 10 to the 23. And so in about five years, humankind has built one trans transistor per sun in the visible universe. And since this is a logarithmic scale, you need to make clear when you look at this portion here, from here to here, this is 99.9% .9 of all the transistors. 
So before that, only 0.1% of all the transistors have been built. Now in 2005, uh, ASML and Zeiss were already market leaders. So it is fair to say that most of the transistors that have ever been built on this planet have been built with ASML scanners and Zeiss optics from Oberkochen. So the motor behind all of this is Moore's law, which basically brought us to develop all these uh, tools that make many, many transistors in a short amount of time. Uh, it's Moore's law, Moore worked for Intel, and he formulated what which most people know is that the number of transistors per device double, or per area actually, double every two years. But there's also an economic side to this, which is more important. This can be shown in the graph on the right side, published by uh, Moore in 1965. The x-axis shows the, uh, num essentially the number of transistors per chip, and the y-axis basically is the cost per transistor. And uh, as you go into, uh, say, the topmost curve, so when you start putting more transistors into your device, naturally the cost per transistor gets cheaper. But as you run out of space and you need to cram the transistors closer and closer together, you will uh, suffer yield loss. And so naturally these curves have uh, a minimum and that minimum moves to larger numbers of transistors per chip as you make those transistors smaller. So uh, economics is a very important element in this. And this here is a time axis and it shows the transistor count per device. And you can see also a logarithmic scale. You can see that we're still in 2018 following this curve quite nicely. When I was young, I remember I was at university and the first, first supercomputer was around, they, uh, was announced. They had computers back then, but this was a supercomputer. They used this to calculate supernova explosions or to pre predict weather. And it was a fantastic machine. It had eight megabytes of memory. It weighed as much as an elephant, consumed a lot of power, and was not particularly cheap. And uh, when you now, many years later, compare this with one of the standard iPhones that you have, for instance, or any of those smartphones, uh, in this case, uh, iPhone XS, it has about 500 times the uh, mega flops, so mega floating point operations per second. It has 65,000 times the memory, weighs close to nothing compared to the Cray, consumes close to no power and costs close to nothing. So this is all due to the motor in the industry given to us by Moore's Law and the technology that we provided to make this happen. And of course, you might ask yourself, where, what else do we need? So I already have 500 Cray ones in my, ha my cell phone. Uh, but then anyone who tries to have a meaningful discussion with Siri will notice that there's still room for improvement, let's say. Uh, I put this picture up. This is a movie that kind of deals about this topic, which I think is worth uh, watching. It's quite interesting, scary also. Um, so there's still many things that we can do to continue follow Moore's law and to make useful things.